Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 11059, Statutory Interpretation. This is Week 12 of Unit 3, or Term 3, 2018, and this is the final week for this unit. We have a great roll-up. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And um, given that we have the Introduction to Law take-home paper live at the moment, some of whom are participating in tonight's um, session, I really do appreciate your attendance. So tonight we're going to um, talk primarily about the unit as a whole, talk about the take-home paper, some general tips in that regard. And um, if those of you that have completed the Introduction to Law paper, if you'd like to share some information, feel free to do so. But just in general terms, we don't want any answers so that it leaks through to those people that are still completing the um, examination. So in terms of the take-home paper for statutory interpretation, as I recall, I'm releasing that tomorrow on the 7th of February at 6.30 p.m. Please correct me if I'm wrong. I expect that the answers will be in by the following day at 11.45 p.m. That's Friday the 8th of February. And you will know by now that the examination, the take-home paper, is one where you must present your work on time. And by that I mean literally on time. 11.45 p.m. I'll stop accepting submissions. Bear in mind that the take-home paper is essentially a replacement for an invigilated examination. The difference being that you at least get to access the internet. You have an opportunity to some degree to collaborate with your colleagues, which you wouldn't be able to do at all in an invigilated examination. And you have more time, um, but ultimately this is one where you must present your work on time. So there is a degree of time pressure about this as well. You don't need the full 29 hours, although I can see that Tuna spent a lot of time in doing his, so well done. Um, oh, issues with the power and the flood. So have a, have a rest this evening, Tuna. Um, in terms of the work that you need to do for the examination, I could say that it genuinely can come from anywhere from this unit, with the exception of the material in week 11. Now, week 11 relates to fundamental human rights in international law. I did mention some aspects of international law in week one. I'll mention now just a few words but suffice to say, as interesting and important as this topic is, it's not essentially examinable. So chapters 11, uh, 12, 13, 14 of your text will not be directly part of the exam. Having said that, um, you can always refer to international law or fundamental human rights in any assessment, including the assessment that um, I've set for you for tomorrow evening. If you are looking at international law and human rights, then probably the starting point would be to consider the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And you can access that through Ostley. Um, there's also some very good material from um, Michael Kirby, former High Court judge, which is readily available also. All right, so the take home paper and a review of the unit to date. If anyone has any questions as we progress, please ask. Please use the chat facility or simply unmute your microphone. Some general comments about presentation of work. Through the feedback that I've provided in both assessments, you've probably got some idea of my expectations and perhaps, arguably, some of my idiosyncrasies. However, whilst it may appear that I'm very stubborn to some degree in relation to certain aspects, there is, I think, a good reason for that. S statutory interpretation is an introductory subject, and I'm very keen for you to get the basics right, because if you don't get it right now, in years two, three, four onwards, then the situation may well mean that you're not getting the feedback because people are saying, well, in third year, I'm not going to correct that and it just goes on um, indefinitely. So uh, you want to get these basics right at the start. One of those basics, and, and so I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about presentation 
and some of the issues that I think are important to ensure that you overcome the threshold, not question, but the threshold um, issue. And that is when the person who's examining your work looks at it, and, and it may be a client, or it may be a partner in a law firm, or it may be a director of your section, whatever it might be, the person who's receiving your work is going to almost immediately form a view of the quality of the work by the way it's set out. And um, those with a trained eye, I think we fairly quickly look for uh, things that just stand out as being incorrect. So one of the keys is to write using academic language, which is more formal than that which might be used in everyday speech. So whereas if you're texting on a phone, you might use contra uh, contractions or you might use abbreviations, there's clearly none of that. So for example, don't use shouldn't or won't. So don't use shorthand in your, na your narratives. And this, the source for that, and I'm quoting a few things now from the Great Guide to University Study, it's topic five, developing academic writing skills. So that's number one. Um, and that's something that I have said on many occasions, I hope that you've, you've picked that up. Number two from that same guide is before you start composing your answer to any assessment problem, take time to analyze the question, the topic or the task that you're addressing. It is too easy to form a preliminary view about what you're asked to do and that may or may not be right. So just take a moment to reflect on that before you go too far. I mentioned I think earlier that the first word is often a good guide as to what it is that you're expected to write. So if the examiner asks you to describe something, that's very different to the examiner asking you to analyze something. So understand the difference in terminology between things like describe, explain, illustrate, analyze, um, things of that nature. So, um, and, and there are there are more, but none come to mind immediately. So analyze, for example, there's an aspect of trying to identify missing uh, missing aspects. And sometimes paper, I do write papers, um, perhaps it's my oversight or perhaps it's intentionally me not putting in something so that your task is to identify that that's missing. And it's a much more difficult task than simply summarizing. Uh, material, which is the sort of thing that you might get in your first assessment. Make sure that you prepare your own set of notes and materials. So in the um, level three examination and short term paper preparation video that I prepared, I encouraged people as level three um, preparation to prepare their material in a form that they can essentially cut and paste, drop into an assessment. Now, it may be that you believe that at some stage in your assessment, you're going to have to describe something about purpose and context and how they fit together. Why not have that written, ready to go, rather than try to think of the words under the pressure of an examination? Level four is where you actually keep that and use that as a drop in for later subjects. So when you're dealing with contract law or torts law or whatever, um, or you're dealing with administrative law, particularly something that's statutory based, if you identify something that relates to context and purpose, there's no, nothing wrong with using something that you've written in, in, in statutory interpretation and bringing it across with you. So this is very much a foundation subject. And what we want you to do is to not only develop the techniques, but also some of the terminology, some of the cases that you can use in later subjects. So having a good set of notes that you prepare, that you've written, will firstly provide you with an advantage in terms of time. Secondly, it will remove considerable amounts of stress because you're not under that pressure to prepare something straight away. And thirdly, and this can't, be under, this can't be overstated, there is less risk of you being 
pinged, for use of a one of a better term, for plagiarism if you've already prepared something in advance and you've carefully moulded it in your language. If you're under pressure to get something produced in an examination or short-term um, paper, you may be tempted to extract something from a text or material and um, then you run the risk of plagiarism or you're simply referring to so much material that it really doesn't identify as yours. So that's number three. Number four is use complete sentences. You can use headings and I encourage you to do that. Sometimes you can actually use a paragraph as a de facto heading. But if you do that, make sure it's in a sentence. So ensure that every sentence is something that can stand alone, make sense on its own. And it does surprise me and disappoint me to see that people write in a way that is not in sentences. Number five, in an examination, use effective time. We're not dealing with that in this instance. Number six is you may have to provide an essay that is by way of analysis. And again, that comes back to an earlier point. Understand the difference between what it is to analyse as opposed to evaluate or to um, summarise. So things of that nature. And very often in my papers, I set a task where you have to adopt a position. And it's very much what lawyers do. You know, we don't have fixed ideas necessarily. We adopt the approach that best meets the client's needs within the ethical context um, that suits on that occasion. So you may have to argue a particular position. It may be that you don't agree. You think the other side is more meritorious, but that doesn't really matter, does it? So your job is to um, uh, adopt a position. Very, very good way to deal with that, though, is to consider the opposing views and think about what the other side might think. So in your take-home paper, if, for example, you're required to present something or interpret statutes or a statute from the perspective of a particular client, a good way to, to answer the problem is at least at some stage, think about what your opponent would do and the approach they'd adopt, and it may give you some good material to write uh, effectively to, to block that approach. Whenever you're preparing legal material, think about legal reasoning. Um, typically, we talk about the IRAC method, issues, rules, application, conclusion. We're all very familiar with that now, I'm sure. But in any assessment work, I would urge you not to to necessarily think that you must use that as the template in writing an answer. So if you try to use the IRAC method in answering a statutory interpretation problem, I think you're going to create a lot of stress for yourself. Whilst there's nothing wrong with that form of legal logic, I don't necessarily think it fits neatly with the type of methodical approach that you need to adopt when interpreting statutes. So think about what you've developed in your toolkit and within that context mould Iraq methodology into it but not the other way around. If you're really stuck in the take-home paper or an exam remember the first half of the marks that are awarded are usually much easier to attain than the second half of the marks and the final 20 percent that is that distinction, high distinction, those 20%, they're the hardest of all to get, much harder to get than the first 20%. Just a reality of life and a way of filtering the, um, uh, the students at that high end, if you like. So um, do, do proofread your work. You should have time to proofread it. If you don't know how to run through a spell check and a grammar check in Word, it's, it won't take you long to, to um, find out, um, but do run a spell check, grammar check, and um, po possibly proofread your work. If you've got time, write it just before you're about to send it. Think, no, I'm going to leave it half an hour, have a cup of tea, whatever it might be. Come back, read it again, and it's surprising how much you see with a fresh pair of eyes. <laughs>
Any questions so far? I know I've been doing a lot of talking. Yes, Amy. Um, I have a bit of a question. I noticed in last year's paper you had um, part B, which had um, a lot of different questions that were set out. I'm just curious, are you looking for an essay-based response to that or is question and answer response okay? Question and answer response is okay, where you have specific questions that need to be asked. But you can, you can incorporate that into a, a, a sort of essay style by using the questions as a heading. Okay. It probably helps me when marking if you actually use the numbers yeah, and um, there's a fair likelihood that you'll have something similar in the exam next time um, in, in for tomorrow. So thank you. Very good thank question. You. Any other questions? All right. Well, it might be an appropriate time to ask if anyone who is currently completing Introduction to Law and perhaps has completed or is well advanced in their take-home paper, which is due at 11.45pm tonight, to provide some feedback, some general, general tips, uh, some ideas. Anybody willing to, to do that? While we're waiting for that, there was a question from Jana. Uh, will the layout of the exam be the same as last term? Yeah, it'll be pretty similar. It'll be pretty similar. So um, in terms of examining you in statutory interpretation, you've probably seen that I've tried to develop a methodical approach to this. At the start, your first assessment was, well, let's, let's see if you can find some legislation and talk about it. Second assessment, let's look at an important statutory interpretation case and let's summarise it and um, identify the main points. Then we moved on into the second assessment of, all right, now that we've got an idea of these general principles, we've got an idea of the important statutory provisions that apply, let's see if you can put it together in a way that makes sense for you leading up, of course, to the third assessment, which is where I ask you to provide an answer in, as best I can, some sort of real life context. Very often in statutory interpretation questions, examiners um, ask you to talk about fictitious legislation. I don't mind that approach at the start. I think in, was it assessment, one of the assessments I gave you, I created some fictitious legislation. Um, so I don't mind that, but it was very simple. You know, I was really only just looking for one or two points. But you would have noticed last year I asked you about, uh, asked the students then questions about actual legislation. So odds are that it will be actual legislation for tomorrow. If you're good enough, if you think it is and you're good enough to guess which act it is that's going through my head, then, or went through my head when I wrote it, then um, you can do some advanced research. All right. Um, now, any comments from a question here specific? Do we need to ask, what do we need to concentrate on for the exam? Asking for a friend. Well, that's a good question. Thinking about your friend. Good on you, Gary. Um, I will go through and talk about some of the important parts of the unit um, shortly. And that might give you a guide as to what you need to concentrate on for the examination. All right. So, Tim... Um, gave a hint in terms of the take-home paper. Seems a long time, but the time goes very quickly. Be beware of distractions. Very good, very good. Tuna says, the keynote to remember is this is a statutory interpretation unit. Yes, I think I specifically said to the introduction to law students who do touch on statutory interpretation, odds are your paper won't deal with statutory interpretation. The reverse applies here. And of course, when we talk about statutory interpretation, the fact is that um, it has to be, this, this is going to sound very trite, but I have to work out a way to examine you and your ability to interpret a statute. So what that means is that I've got to select a statute, I think, to present to you, to say, here's the statute that I'm now presenting to you. And it seems to mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the best way that I can ask you to interpret that statute is to provide some factual scenario for you that you've got, you can then look at the act and try and, you know, um, interpret the act within the context of that 
factual scenario. So that's what you can expect, at least for the main part of the examination. I hope that makes sense. Question is, is it a case comparison? Um, by that, Tim, I'm not sure if you mean, is it going to be based on the facts of a real case? And the answer is it might be. Um, I know I'm very vague on that. Some of the questions that I write are actually drawn from a real case. And you'll see that Dr. Michelle Sanson does that quite often in her text. She'll draw the facts and they'll say, look, these facts are based on the real case of this. So I may have done that or I may have completely invented something. Um, so I won't give you any more than that, I'm sorry. But there may be similar features from real cases. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's entirely possible. So that's a hybrid situation. All right, so thank you very much for that. Tuna says, have a v VB. Well, perhaps that might help. Um, maybe a nice cup of tea <laughs> or a coffee might help or soda water. Uh, what time do you expect it should take to do the exam, says Gareth? That's a really good question. Well, um, experience tells me that people spend much longer in a take-home paper than they would for an invigilated examination. If it was a paper and pen exam, the current trend is to two-hour papers. It was previously in many units three, now it's two. That's not very long at all. Um, if you really, really do the work well, you might be able to get the work done in three hours, but I think typically most people would take longer than that. It's not meant to be scary, but the idea is that you should be able to present something very good in two to three hours. But if you go beyond that, that's fine. There's no problem with that. If you've got the time, well, you can just settle in and enjoy the process. What I'm trying to do in the exam is actually encourage you to learn, to continue. Yes, enjoy it, Gareth. Yeah, <laughs> I meant that word intentionally. Um, because I'll tell you why you can enjoy the exam for statutory interpretation. It's a bit of a voyage of discovery. Now, by its very nature, I'm examining you on something that we haven't actually touched on in the unit. And I mentioned this to the introduction to law students because my emphasis um, leading up to that was a lot of legal research. Here, the emphasis is on interpreting a statute. You don't know what statute it's going to be. You've got a fair idea now from what I've said, it's a real statute but you don't know whether it's Commonwealth, you don't know whether it's state, and you don't know which one it is. And you know that you'll have a factual scenario. So it's a voyage of discovery. You won't know the act, and you won't know the factual scenario. So it's all about using your technique to learn and apply in the exam. So I expect that you'll actually be learning something in the process of producing the answer for the examination. Um, Jana says, it's best to treat it as a three-hour exam, then use the extra time to proofread and fine-tune. That's a really good approach because if you don't put a little bit of pressure on yourself, then you may find that the time just disappears and you get lost in it. All right, so very good. So um, any other questions so far? All good? Now, when you're reading through your text, one of the first things that I'd ask you to do is have a look at the preface. Um, page 33, that's Roman numerals 33, of the preface, and you'll see the list of case exercises, 3.1 through to 13.2. And um, I would encourage you to look at those and work around those so that if you can, if you can answer those questions, then that will be a great way to know that you have overcome the difficulties of reading the textbook and understanding the concepts. Now, let's just do a quick unit overview. As you know, this is an introductory law subject or unit. So what that means is that in many ways, I'm not teaching you much substantive law. In many ways, I'm teaching you more procedural law the procedures that you need to adopt in order to answer substantial law questions. So in your exam, you have an opportunity to answer a substantive law question using these techniques that you've developed. And statutory interpretation, 
is now a very important part of all your legal studies, all your legal career. You might recall a quote that I gave at an early stage by Michael Kirby, who said, and this is from Statutory Interpretation, The Meaning of Meaning from 2011. Um, the former High Court judge said, statutory interpretation has replaced the analysis of judicial reasons about common law as the most important task ordinarily performed by Australian lawyers. This was inevitable as the amount of law made by or under legislation increased and the room for residual common law narrowed. So we, you understand what I mean by common law, judge made law, as opposed to statute law. By far now, most of our law is statute law based. That wasn't the case in the 80s um, necessarily or before that, but it certainly is now. So understanding how to interpret a statute is, according to Justice Kirby, the most important task ordinarily performed by Australian lawyers. You'll know that throughout the unit, I've placed a premium on practical methodology. So that is you developing an approach to statutory interpretation that's systematic and comprehensive. And what that means is that uh, you won't know the law relevant to a question before you start, but your idea, this voyage of discovery, is to look at the statute and work your way through it so that eventually you find the answer. All right, just to digress, the next thing that I perhaps talked about was the Australian Guide to Legal Citation. I do hope that everyone is aware of that. You've got some of the basics. Footnotes end with a full stop. Footnote numbers, you know, the superscript, as I call it, in the text, appears after the relevant punctuation in the text, not before it. Um, use single quotations for short quotes. If you've got a quote of more than three lines, indent, drop a line, um, indent from the left margin, and no quotation marks at that stage. Question is, footnotes don't count in the exam for the word count? That's correct. So I don't count word, I don't count footnotes in the, um, in the, the word count. <clears throat> the word count, by the way, from memory is 400 words for part A, which is an essay style question, and 1800 words in part B. You can go over that. Um, you know, if you're 2000, there's no problem with that. If you go beyond 2000, I'll be starting to wonder. I actually reduced the word count so that people didn't feel so much pressure if they were struggling to find enough to write about. But usually the problem is the other way around. Make sure that if you're footnote referencing, you understand how to use IBID or above N and um, understand how to cite cases. If you have the same case reported in different um, reports, use the um, official citation, the reported, the authorised report. Okay. Um, obviously, you'll need to be aware of intrinsic guides, principles and presumptions employed by the courts, uh, extrinsic materials, the relevant interpretation acts, and the way in which con context plays a part in all of this. And you might recall at the start, we talked about issues to do with what is meant by intention and purpose and object and motive. So intention relates to the meaning of the enactment. Purpose or object relates to the mischief to which the enactment was directed and motive is the political reasons for legislating it. Then we talked about the Acts Interpretation Acts, Commonwealth and Queensland. Um, Unfortunately, well, because I've got a Queensland-based piece of legislation um, if, uh, uh, for the examination, that is, unless it's a Commonwealth piece of legislation, um, if it is Queensland, you'll have to reference it by the Acts Interpretation Act of Queensland. If you do use a different state, uh, just let me know at the start that, you know, you're looking at this from a WA perspective or a... Victorian perspective or whatever, and I'll, I'll understand and I won't mark you down. But I'd still like you to use the um, Queensland Acts Interpretation Act if it's a uh, 
state-based piece of legislation. Now, if it's um, Commonwealth, then of course the Act's interpretation out of Commonwealth. Um, do I take, would I take it that everyone knows how to find out the date legislation is enacted, state and federal? Good. If, if not, you'll need to know that. Uh, you'll need to know how to find the date of assent of legislation. All right. If you don't, make sure you find out or you can ask a question. Now, you need to know how to find second reading speeches. All good on that, says Tim. That's good. Second reading speeches, Commonwealth and um, the state. We should be able to know how to access that. This will be in your toolkit anyway. And explanatory memorandum for the, for the Commonwealth or explanatory note for Queensland. Again, you'll need to know how to access that because almost certainly I would have thought that you'd need to look at these extrinsic materials in answering a statutory interpretation problem. Now, I mentioned earlier purpose. When it comes to purpose, there's that subtle difference you'll recall between that which is in the Commonwealth Acts Interpretation Act and that which is in the Queensland um, Act. So in the Commonwealth legislation, have a look at section 15, capital A, capital A, which in requires you to interpret, to make an interpretation that would best achieve the purpose or object of the act that is preferred to each other interpretation. Um, so in the Commonwealth, uh, it had a different formulation before 2011 where the preferred construction was a methodology. So just, just note that change in 2011 in the Commonwealth sphere. So look at section 15AB in the Commonwealth, which is to do with the use of extrinsic materials in the interpretation. And I expect that you'll um, use that partly as a checklist as to what you might consider referring to as um, uh, something for an extrinsic material, but also as a, as a reference in itself. In Queensland, the counterpart provision is section 14B. I suspect you already know that. Um, slight, again, slightly different wording. Consideration may be given to extrinsic material in certain circumstances. And you'll recall some case law in relation to the use of extrinsic materials. Mills and Meeking, 1990. The High Court said if the language is clear and the purpose expressly stated in the Act, then there may be no cause to refer to extrinsic materials. So if you believe as part of your answer to the statutory interpretation problem that the language is clear and the purpose expressly stated in the Act, then you'd use Mills and Meeking as your authority as to why you didn't have cause to refer to extrinsic materials. Modern approach, context is uh, at the first instance and the leading case there, CIC insurance against Bankstown Football Club. So context is in that case was used in its widest sense. And of course, there's Project Blue Sky, you know all about that. You may need to consider the common law approaches. We tend not to these days um, at per se, but the literal rule, the golden rule, the mischief rule, there's still nothing wrong with referring to those in uh, an answer to a problem, if you wish. And one thing that I think is sometimes overlooked are the statutory presumptions. And um, have a look at Chapter 9, where there is a discussion about statutory interpretation developed at common law, which has had some continuing application as a statutory presumption. All right. So that's my quick, really quick overview. I, I haven't mentioned intrinsic materials, but you know that, that that's also part of it. And um, I'm sure by now you've got the sections that you think are important and you've got the cases you think are important ready to go for your answer. When it comes to answering, I'll just go back to the um, take home paper. When it comes to answering the paper, I'm going to leave it entirely to you to determine the emphasis 
and the number of words that you might use for different parts of the question. You would have noticed that I adopted that same approach last year. The, part of the reason I do that is that everyone approaches this in a different manner. And the way that I might approach it doesn't necessarily make it right. And if I am too prescriptive in terms of methodology for marking, it means that I may inadvertently penalise someone who's provided a, a, a remarkably good answer, but just not in the same, with the same emphasis that I might do. I hope that makes sense. All right, well, I've just about said all that I need to say. And um, thank you very much for listening to me this evening and throughout this unit. Before we wrap up, are there any issues, any questions? We're all good for the take home paper? All right. Now, those of you that haven't yet undertaken or completed your in a, um, introduction to law uh, take home paper, have a little break and then get back into it. Um, otherwise, make sure that you um, uh, look out for the paper. Now, I will release the paper in Moodle. So what you do is you go to the third assessment in the assessment block and at about 6.30 p.m. you will see the paper is then, is there, and I'll send you, I'll send everyone a news forum to say I've released it as a reminder. Okay, thank you all. Um, appreciate that. Please provide some feedback and good luck with the exam. All the best then. Bye.